Hey, good morning, team. Hey, we're about a, we're about a minute out, and I thought I'd take the liberty, probably start off a little bit early, uh, have about 15 minutes. I'll try to keep it under 10 and uh, open the floor up for a couple conversations um, or questions. So when AFCA posted, my name's Raymond Reyes. I'm the Chief Business Development Officer. I work for Corvus Consulting, right? So if you have any questions about what I put up here, so what I'm going to go over is a like five, ten thousand foot level. I don't want to go into I triple E, double E engineering type of things uh, because I, I tend to lose the audience very quickly. Uh, there's three there's three populations that can talk a lot, and that's uh, recruiters, SAR majors, and spectrum managers, and I happen to be all three. So I try to. So let me let me let me cover briefly on what this uh, discussion is going to talk about. And if you probably read the synopsis, you know we had a in the emergent era of great power competition. Our nation's adversaries seek to achieve their strategic aims short of traditional conflict, what we call the gray zone. Right? They, they'll do this across the Pamisi PT lines uh, from phase zero through phase five um, and, and try to exploit that space. Uh, the, the importance of cross-functional cyber, electronic warfare, SIGINT has been recognized for the last decade, not only by the United States, but our near peer competitors as well. Um, so this is a competitive fight with a com completely moving target. Uh, communications, aviation's infrastructures rely tremendously upon the carefully uh, regimented and controlled use of the electromagnetic spectrum, right? So what I'm going to talk about briefly is uh, spectrum and cyber training constraints within the continental United States across operations, methods to try to mitigate and work around them in order to achieve a well-trained and integrated SEMA force. Uh, in support of multi-domain battle, uh, low probability of intercept and low probability of detection. So on the LP, LPD, LPI, I suspect that when they put this agenda up here, there was a specific problem they want to solve, but they didn't go into it, into the details. Uh, so it makes it kind of difficult to talk about, hey, what is the problem and then what is the specific solution you're going to be looking at? Because traditionally LPD, LPI uh, has to deal with radar systems and aviation and the uh, anti-access, anti-denial construct. And then when you actually talk about the ground forces and what does that mean to us, I think the bottom line up front is, hey, do you want the adversary to know you're there or do you want the adversary or do you want to remain hidden? And so based on the answer to those two questions is going to be dependent upon, the, an the solution is going to be dependent upon um, one or the other. Hey, so let me talk a little bit about this, right? So this isn't very well known across the Department of Defense. I've briefed this once or twice. And so I'm going to illustrate how this pertains to authority and performance electronic attack during operations. So when we talk about, when we talk about multi-domain ops, what exactly does that mean? And I have a slide that goes a little bit, and so it'll probably make sense why I'm talking about this. Uh, commanders perform electronic attack under COCOM authority, OK? It's a, it's a legal instrument, and I'll discuss the legal instrument. So under phases two, seize the initiative, and three, dominate. Uh, the command, commander may drive electronic attack based off of operational necessity. But when you start talking about phases zero, one, you know, deter, stabilize, enable civil authority, the commander, combatant commander is driven to respect the laws of the country under the appropriate legal instruments and coordinate for RDT&E-like coordination for EA. So a lot of the combatant command um, instruments or SOFA agreements tie into International Telecommunications Union and that those agreements are taken back to Congress and it's written like law so there is a coordination that we have to commit and by law in a lot of senses the, the ability to perform EA in peacetime environments is actually treated as a frequency assignment and so that may be counterintuitive for those uh, operators who are used to working EA 6 ec 130 compass calls who are used to radiating based off operational need. But once you get outside phase two, phase three, um, you, you are going to be bound to that construct. Uh, many times the legal instrument is in the form of a treaty, status of forces agreement, UN resolution. Uh, a good example was the war in Iraq. Uh, the UN Security Council Resolution 1483 and the corresponding coalition provisional authority articles did not specifically call out an authority to perform electronic attack. However, it does allow for the protection of life and limb, and under legal review is warranted that performing electronic attack to protect U.S. forces was essential in protecting life. Uh, and thus, the host nation permission was not required to perform EA under phase two, phase three operations. All right. So what about here in the United States? 
all right? Uh, I felt the, the following was important to outline because although there's a short blurb on title, U.S. Code Title 47 authority within the Army's field manual, uh, the following is not clearly understood across the force. Uh, I felt understanding the backbone of overarching authority form EA assists in the discussion with sometimes with electronic protect and how does that all fit in multi-domain battle and LPI and LPD. So in a similar fashion how Title 10 has a relationship with Title 50 um, in regards to SIGINT and EW support, there is a relationship between Title 10 and Title 47 and the Title 47 covers the authorities that the FCC and the NTIA uh, utilize in order to manage the airwaves or perform electronic attack. Within the USMP, electronic attack is treated as a frequency assignment. The FCC manages the commercial airwaves and the National Communications Information NC, the NTIA manages the federal banded spectrum. Uh, the Inter-Service Radio Advisor uh, Committee is an NTIA working group chaired by representatives from the entirety of federal government, not just the DOD, but you know, like the FBI, State Department, Department of Interior. Um, the IRAC's basic function is to assist the, assist, uh, the Assistant Secretary in assigning frequencies to U.S. government radio stations and in developing executive policy programs, procedures. And there's two th distinct authorities within the U.S. to perform electronic attack. Uh, EA clearances in support of RDT&E within the United States and Canada is covered by, it's delegated to Department of Defense under CJCSM, Chairman Joint Chiefs of, Stra uh, Chairman Joint Chiefs of Staff Manual 3212 and also codified via the NTIA Red Book. Uh, the federal agency lead coordination is the DOD, and so if you're a program or record and you need an RDT&E RDT &E authority, that record is processed to the, through that specific military department's spectrum management office, right? Uh, so the Army's under this authority, and all those clearances go through the Army CIO G6 on the Army staff and the Army Spectrum Management Office, all right? So another piece of authority that's not very well known, the process for coordinating operational clearances, right? So we have a homeland defense mission as well, right? So what happens if some bad guy wants to turn something on uh, or wants to <coughs> detonate something in a city, right? So the federal executive agent for that is the FBI. And the FBI has, a, has an MOA with the Department of Defense and the EOD community in order to clearly go through that process, issue a no TAMS, quick responsive, uh, and, to, and to the point. So how does that figure in a multi-domain battle, right? So multi-domain battle, so the operational framework for the future is critical. So the multi-domain battle extends battle space to strategic areas for both friendly and enemy forces. It expands targeting landscape based on the extended ranges and lethality delivered at range by integrated air defenses, cross-domain fire support, and the cyber electronic warfare systems. So previous over the last five years, we talked about SEMA, Cyber Electromagnetic Activities, which is the SIGANT, uh, electronic warfare, and the cyber equities. So you have to ask yourself, with gray zone area conflict, what is the enemy, what's the adversary going to do to deny your ability to project combat power in those phases zero, one, five, and so on? Traditionally, uh, the U.S. and our allies, we've historically have had spectrum dominance by default by decimating the adversary C4 ISR capability in support of phase two and phase three operations, right? So this discussion about, hey, what is the adversary doing to undermine uh, U.S. forces? You see it now in the media uh, with disinformation campaigns and some of the things General Fogarty was talking about. So that brings on discussion, okay, if I need to integrate all of these items, how do I train? I need to train as I fight, right? And in order to do that within the environment, you have to start looking at what your ranges, ranges and your, what your range capabilities are, right? So in order to do multi-domain battle and try to answer the question of what does LPI and LPD mean to the operational force, you're gonna need to be able to train as you fight and effectively build scenario event listings. And I used to work in the office that processed all the electronic attack requests for the Army within the Army CIO G6. And there's very few ranges out there where you could do full spectrum. What we've had to do is kind of curtail and tailor the EA threat load sets. So 
how these mission statements would look like in support of multi-domain battle and how you're integrating electronic warfare, cyberspace operations, and SIGINT. You really do need uh, an operational range or training environment where you can actually test, not just test this stuff, but give soldiers, sailors, airmen, and sailors the confidence to integrate those kind of fires. So, uh, and I will tell you, in my experience, there was a, there's an organization up in Indiana, and you see the Atterbury Muscat attack, and I always mispronounce that, uh, Muscatatuck. Yeah, see, I'm getting the corrections, so it's all good. Who writes this stuff? Man? Uh, <laughs> that does provide, they're in a, I call it what, a, the geographically gifted zone, because usually one of the bottlenecks for performing EA is getting a chop from the Federal Aviation Administration. And so there's very little overhead flights uh, that prevents, you know, because sometimes you go to some training ranges, hey, you can only radiate the system between 02 and 05 in the morning when nothing's flying, right? Uh, you also have to find a range that can, you know, support the SIGINT side of the house. And so like this organization has, uh, you know, they, they've worked out the commercial clearances to be able to test things within commercial uh, cell phone bands. And so that gives you a lot of room to maneuver. So this, this place, I mean, you can't move brigades there, but you can move, I'm not brigades, but like division or core, but you can do brigade and battalion type maneuver, uh, coordinate all the electronic attack requests and accesses in order for them to receive, try to, try to achieve the effects. Uh, and it's, it's very, but how does that tie it into LPI and, and LPD? So as, as I noted before in the beginning of the conversation, so what is the problem you're trying to solve and how does the language solve it, okay? So low probability detection is, hey, do you want the adversary to know you're there or you don't? So those of us who grew up in the Cold War, uh, I, I grew up in reconnaissance units, and they used to say, hey, keep your radio burst transmission under four seconds because the Soviets could track you down and they will either come look for you or they will fire up a BM-21 to light up the grid square, you know? So in this particular case, uh, LPI, LPD is really dependent upon what's the problem we're trying to solve. And I'll, I'll be honest, so if you kind of looked at the slides. Um, this is an issue that the policy framework has to be understood from the national strategic level down to the tactical level in order so you can define and maneuver within this, because sometimes, and as a the last statement, in a sense, uh, sometimes we have technologies fully capable, available, and we have the ability to utilize, but sometimes the framework that I discussed limits our ability to do that. And unless our staff understands that and the commander understands that in order to maneuver, uh, you know, those are things that need to be taken through the staffing process. So if you have any questions on this, feel free, I work for Corvus Consulting. We are able to help you in any manner you see. If you've got questions or you want to talk off to the side, we can go a little bit more in depth about these issues because we have the expertise uh, across the cyber, the electronic warfare, and the spectrum management, spectrum management range. So I think I will open the floor to questions because we've got three minutes. Is that correct? Three minutes. Two minutes. Yes. That's a great question. That's a great question. Okay, so what, what, about 10 years ago, I started getting involved in the National Training Center on how to do electronic attack, and they couldn't get clearances in a large swath of radio bands. So what we said was, so NT, for those of you familiar with NTC, is they heard the comm plan uh, for the incoming rotational units. So what they had to do is narrow down what they were performing electronic attack bands it would be between 30 and 88 megahertz. And so, ironically, you bring that question, I made the suggestion a while back to uh, build the Singar's load set within a very narrow band and then develop electronic attack mission scenario event listings uh, that target that specific radio band so that way you can achieve the training effect. The difference between there and another, like talking about Indiana, 
is you have a lot more diversity in what you can access in the electromagnetic. You want to target ISR platforms, you want to ta target C-band, you want to target SATCOM, you want to target, right? So you got to, it's not just Singar's radios you're talking about, but the whole brigade combat team has, you know, it's like 1,200 emitters now, right? So you want to develop a training effect in order to achieve that. Thanks, Scott. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, well, I'll tell you what, if anybody runs into that problem, call me. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm serious, because it, it is get, it is kind of complicated on how to uh, get those clearances, and that's one of the things we can discuss. Um, so as I mentioned, all the EA clear, the RDT and E clearances are processed by the military service departments, right? So although the FBI has, I got cut off, although the FBI has the authority to process all the electrical Okay, we want to go ahead and get started. Uh, good morning, my name is Mike Beeler. I'm the uh, Vice President of Waveform uh, and Analytics Virtualization for Invisticom. Um, I am extremely technical, so I can go clear to the bit level, but we'll try to keep it as high level. Um, if you want to talk about any of the uh, technology uh, post uh, presentation, I'll hang around, I'll be glad to speak with you. Um, first of all, some of the topic, this topic will be a little controversial. I know a lot of people, when they see it, they kind of roll their eyes, yeah, 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 they believe it, yeah, it's just, it's just marketing fluff. It's not marketing fluff. So what I want to say, we've been working on this for about four years. Um, this started as a phase two SIBR with the U.S. Army. Um, we want a phase one, we're finishing up the phase two, and the woodwork effect is happening right now. We are getting funding from all the branches, agencies, as I describe it, it's real. It's not one of these pie in the sky things. The other thing I want to point out right away, you're actually using this technology, you just don't know it. But as we go through this, you're gonna see how many people will use Amazon? How many buy things through Amazon? How many people use Google? How many people use Microsoft? The virtualized architecture, the hardware, is actually in the field and running today, okay? With that being said, Communication infrastructure is extremely complex. As you can see, there's a lot of disparate networks. Um, it's complex. The overlay systems are purpose-built. Um, the communications architecture is a waveform is built for an application. The equipment is built for an application. So when you buy a modem, you buy a, a radio, you buy a piece of hardware, an analytics processing uh, application, they're purpose built. They do one thing and you're stuck with that piece of equipment for the life of the product. It does not change. So what I would like to do is go through and talk about where we've been, what the problems are, and how we can overcome those issues for a future architecture. Um, some examples in the lower right corner, you'll see uh, BFT, there's two types of BFT. Can BFT one talk to BFT two? No, they cannot. You have MUOS, you have um, UHF, all these architectures, they do one thing and only one thing. They can speak, they can communicate within their own architecture. Further to that point, the issues with the current architecture are that the, uh, the modems that are going out there, single purpose, single application, the purpose built, each of the communication paths require a waveform per application. So if you have LPI, LPD, you have an LPD, LPI, LPD modem. If you have a trunk, you have a trunking modem. 
those modems, once they're deployed, those architectures, they are the same. They do not change in the current architecture. Um, you can't repurpose the equipment after you send it. After you load it on a UAV, can you repurpose it? You, you load the UAV, you, or the UAS, you load it, you send it on its mission, and it's gone for 24 hours or 22 hours to do its work. You can't change the waveform on the fly. Unless it's loaded in the comm deck, or it's loaded as an LRU, you have the LRUs loaded up in the uh, UAS, you're not going to be changing the mission in any way, shape, or form. The hardware is not vendor interoperable. Good luck taking vendor A, B, and C. Typically, they have a waveform, they speak, they can communicate with themselves. They can't change the architecture on the fly. SDR, that's the one that I want to home in on. There's a misnomer. There's a virtualized architecture, a virtual modem, virtual analytics, then there's software defined. I want to demystify that. There's one slide we'll probably spend most of our time on in this, uh, in this deck. And it's difficult to deploy after, uh, after we've put them on a ship. For example, uh, the LPI OPD, I spent the last seven years of my life working on that with one of the DOD groups. I have to tell you, we worked for years to get it right, send the ship into production, or send this modem into production, and it will not change for 10 years. So again, what we're gonna talk about today will we'll address this. I'm not gonna read this to you, but basically, a virtualized modem or a virtualized analytics engine is one that you write an application, okay, a high-level application, and you can take that application and put it on any piece of hardware. I mean, when you're talking PCs, Linux or Windows, eh, that's pretty common, we're used to that. But to take a communications waveform, a synchronous waveform, is typically built for a handheld radio or a vehicular mounted radio. You don't put it on a PC. You can't move it across platforms. It's not possible. It is possible now. And this is what we're gonna talk about. So, and I so I'll apologize, I have to put glasses. I can't read. Uh, over 50, you can't see anything. So today, the purpose built, um, everything's purpose built, okay? Modems, you buy a modem, you buy a handheld radio, they're purpose built, that's all they're used for. The new architecture we're proposing, it's virtualized. You write everything in a high level application and the hardware is agnostic. It doesn't matter what you put it on. A handheld radio, a, a man net, a satellite modem, uh, a cell phone, and this is ultimately our target, folks. This will be a, this will be a, a platform that will run any tactical radio or any satellite uh, waveform. So everything's purpose-built, we're moving it to COTS. It's commercial off-the-shelf PCs and HPCs. Everything is vendor-specific on the waveforms. We're looking at an open computing environment. So you write one application, you write one architecture, and it drops into all the hardware. It's completely agnostic. So we're trying to break this mentality that's hampering our warfighter and our, United, and our government where we simply have a single box, single function, why not have it work across all the platforms? Limited scalability, what we're proposing is unlimited scalability. Functionality is limited in a purpose-built modem. We're talking about unlimited. I know these are, these are big words and they're big jumps, they're big leaps of faith, but it's real. So, for example, um, there's, in the top, those are all purpose-built modems and you can see who the manufacturers are. It's no big jump to see who that is. What we're proposing is, and we are doing, we're actually doing this, we're taking many of those, if not all of those waveforms sitting there in front of you, and we're virtualizing them, they're becoming a software application. They go into any number of devices. They can go into uh, a high-performance computing platform that sits in the cloud. It can go into a high-performance computer that sits at the RHN. It can go into, down to a handheld radio. So what you end up doing is you write the application, the virtualized waveform at the highest level, and you drop it down into the hardware, and it operates. This is the slide I want to spend a lot of time. So looking at this slide, when you develop a uh, handheld radio, you develop an application which is comprised of two things. The application code, which runs on the CPU, and you want to look at, and, and then there's the, the HDL, which is the hardware descriptive, descriptive language. That's the FPGA. Those are highly compensated engineers. They're weenies that sit in the back room, bits and bytes. When they write that code, that code's done, it's committed, and it goes into the radio, and off it goes. The problem is, it, how many radios will it function on? 
one, one manufacturer. It's not even a family of radios, one radio. So that code, that code is purpose built into that radio. As another example is an FDMA modem. You know, a Comtech modem and a BISAP modem, an IDIREC modem, a NewTek modem, their code is developed and it drops on that platform and only that platform. You cannot pick that code up and move it to another platform. Uh, and then the last one on the right is the one that everybody seems to be even confused with. The Edis radio is an SDR. It's a software-defined radio. So you write your code, your high-level code. Okay, it is high-level code. How many radios will it run on? One. It's still a purpose-built piece of hardware. You're still stuck to a manufacturer. So what we have what we are proposing, and by the way, we're not coming up with this as an exclusive architecture. It's inclusive. We want everyone to play. We want everyone to come into our ecosystem. Bring your waveform. We're not trying to block anyone out. So looking at the bottom of the, the slide, look at all those. You, you, do one, you do one development exercise for the waveform, and it drops into all those platforms in the bottom. That's a one RU that can go into the cloud. That's a small uh, radio uh, development kit, or it can be in a terminal. Uh, the middle one is called the Ember. That's uh, in Vistacom's terminal. It's a combination antenna with uh, the virtualized modem underneath of it. The next is the handheld radio. And, and I know there are probably people saying, oh, yeah, right. Guys, we're building this. We're actually building this right now in Maryland. And we're funded to do all of this work. And uh, the last one is a PC. Again, it can run on a desktop. Um, the demo platform that we take around and we show people, it is actually a, a PC talking to purpose-built modems. And we talk to many different purpose-built modems. There's nothing cooler than seeing the DVB-S2 waveform running at multi-hundreds of megabits to, from a PC, it's real. It's, and and DVB-S2, S2X is like one of the most complex waveforms on the planet. Uh, this is an eye chart, but bottom, and I got the five minute warning. So what I wanna get across here is the infrastructure, it's changing. I mean, it's becoming complex. We have folks like OneWeb, Viasat, Hughes, Amazon, LeoSat. These are the Leo constellations. Do you wanna carry eight different radios? Is that feasible for the warfighter? It's not. Do we carry eight different cell phones? We do not. So what we're proposing is in a virtualized architecture, you drop it into the hardware, all the waveforms are resonant for every one of those, and off you go. You, know, you just switch the waveforms on the fly. That's, you switch applications on your PC. Why is it any different for a purpose-built or a, a non-purpose-built uh, communication device? The other thing is in this environment, the code is in high-level language. It's a high-level construct. It's not code that you have the guys in the back room going bits, bytes, bits, bytes. You now have a different class of people and we can harvest them out of the universities. You, as the government, take total control of your world. Um, reduce development and innovation cycles. You can develop C code like this. In fact, every waveform, if there's any waveform developers in here, they start at C and MATLAB. That's where you start. You, don't, you no longer commit down into the hardware, the hardware description language. You, stay, you start at C, you stay at C. Um, reduce costs, obviously it's cheaper. You hire cheaper people, you can, rep, you can replicate, you can design, and you can debug more quickly. And simplify its sustainment. Um, this will probably be the last slide I show. This is the proof. This isn't, this isn't made up. We're putting up almost 10,000 spacecraft. These are, these, are, these are spacecraft that are all using different waveforms, different architectures, again, you don't want to carry eight to 10 different radios or 10, 10 different mobile devices. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up and are there any questions? Yes, sir. So is this taking a page from SDN to NMD? And that is I, what you're driving, software-defined networks? Do not know that. Um, no. I've not heard of that, sorry. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Sure, that, that is absolutely the intent. It won't be an iPhone. Um, it will be a brand new architecture that's coming out from people like Intel. Intel is coming out with parts. Um, they're no longer you know, a PC board this big. They'll fit in this. And, and guys, we're under contract to go to this. This is where we're going. The Ultra Lab at the Army, they hold up, they hold up their cell phones and they go, yeah, we're, we're currently this big, but, but to jump, to go from this big, and this inclu includes the crypto, the crypto, the transact, everything will be, we will make it there. It will be an app store-like. I'm not an app, I'm not an, uh, uh, an Apple fan, just some people will chuckle. Um, I'm an Android fan. It'll be between like an Android uh, Play Store and an Apple App Store, but the hardware will have to change. You will have to have a heterogeneous type processor, but it, it's completely doable. We're down to the point, we're down to the point where we can get this down into uh, a small footprint. So with that, thank you so much. So good morning and thanks for coming. Uh, appreciate your interest. I'm Lawrence Kingsley from Viasat, and uh, as the slide suggests, I want to talk about another way to look at uh, LPI, LPD, and resilient SATCOM. Previous speaker made a point. He said he worked on uh, uh, LPD, LPI, LPI systems, and the focus has always been on the waveform. I want to talk to you about a little different way to look at it. So uh, let, to understand an alternative approach, let's first understand what the general principles of uh, low probability detect or, and resilient SATCOM are. First of all, you want to reduce the visible terminal power as much as possible. You want to keep your power signature down. And usually that's done by using waveforms that have very low required uh, transmission power. It can be, you know, very robust BPSK waveforms like BPSK one-third or spread waveforms or combinations of the same. Uh, CDMA, code division multiple access, like on our ArcLight product, Viasat's ArcLight product. Uh, uh, SDMA, uh, like on the uh, Use product. Right, but the thing is, all those waveforms trade resiliency and uh, LPI, LPD for throughput. So you have to have just a, a trade-off. And traditional satellites, traditional bent pipe satellites have very limited transponder space, so that limits how far you can spread out, and really, it, li it limits the, the, the how, how far you can go. You can also design your terminals to try to reduce your RF signature using very tightly focused beams, trying to keep the spillover off the dish low. You can shroud the dish. But all that's more difficult at uh, traditional bent pipe satellite frequencies because, as you know, as the frequency goes down, like X and C band, the dishes get big, right? So what I'm going to say, I want to say is look at it again. Let's forget about the waveform for a little bit. Think about, uh, you know, what's the real factor. And high-capacity KA satellites really have the bandwidth and the high-gain spot beams to make LPI, LPD possible. So the satellite is the key enabler. That's, that's the one I'm positing here. If you look at beam coverage, C, X, KU band, you know, gives you broadcast and, and some low speed duplex communications, lower speed duplex, but a single beam could cover an entire continent or hemisphere, right? So that means that your adversaries are in your beam. Um, older KA satellites, think, you know, traditional KA, gives you a handful of beams, like WGS has 10. Most of those would cover the size of a U.S. state or several states, maybe a whole, maybe a, a, a small country. But high capacity KA gives you from 50 to 1,000 beams. So the beams, for example, uh, on the, the, the picture on the right, uh, up, upper right, that's a representation of what the Viasat 3 class satellite beam layout will look like. It's just a, a representation. The, the beams are about the size of a county, a U.S. county. So, so now you've got um, uh, the performance, you've got the bandwidth, and you've got the performance, because now you've got all that power focused in one small beam, and all that high gain in the satellite. So what does that do for you? It gives you smaller terminals, it gives you more throughput. The transponders on, on high-capacity K satellites are uh, hundreds of megahertz, just to say, because instead of cataloging them all. In the bottom picture, you see the example of, uh, like, on the, on, the, on the one side, left side, is Utilsat 10A. Just, it's just their footprint. You can pull that off the web. You can see that your adversaries are in your beam. On the right, you can see a, uh, tip, another KU beam over, over uh, Japan. Again, your adversaries are inside your beam. They can, li they can listen to you. They can jam you. So but look at, look at, let's look at some um, representative high-capacity K satellite footprints. Uh, the spot beam roll-off, you look at the left side, that's a, a 
representative example of Viasat 1, a Viasat 1 beam down in Florida. It's a 30 dB roll off from the center to the outside edge. So an adversary, for example, shown in Cuba would be to have a 30 dB disadvantage to you. He has to bring a pretty big jammer to the, to the party to get you. And if he's trying to listen to you, he's 30 dB down already. On the right side, you see the beam layout for KA sat, UTIL sat, KA sat in Europe. Again, small beams covering, covering uh, portions of states. All that puts the, puts the, uh, the adversary at a disadvantage. But also remember, in high capacity K satellites, the user and the gateway are not in the same beam. So I might be here in, in Richmond County here in Augusta, but my gateway might be in Colorado on Viaset 1, for example. So it's, it's not, it's, it's a different, it's a whole other way of looking at it. So if you look at, this is just a WGS uh, representative layout over the Pacific, X and KU band beams. They're larger beams, they have limited bandwidth, and there's only about 10 of them, 10, about 10 KA beams, for example. About five interferers can take out the whole satellite. If we look at a representative ISAT-3 layout for the Pacific, it's thousands of beams. The beams are now very, very small. It's looking more like a cell phone network. This is a representative ISAT-3 beam compared to a WGS beam with a difference. And all of our beams are nulling beams. So if you have an adversary, you, you, can, you can null that cell. This inverts the, the, the asymmetry. Usually you say, you say things like, the cheap jammer can take out the expensive satellite. The poor man's jammer takes out, you know, WGS or something. But with Viasat 3, you need thousands of jammers to take out the satellite. It turns the, turns the economics on, the head, on its head. So that means, what that means is, you know, we keep thinking about waveforms uh, for LPI, LPD. We think about terminals design. But if you look at our traditional terminals, the terminals we field today, they, that design has to change, right? Because these are non-optimal terminals put together with a a la carte menu, you know, up like a buck from here, an LMB from there, a reflector from there. I've got a, you know, I've got control software made by somebody over here. None of those are optimized for any particular satellite. It's kind of like the use on any satellite concept. So the jack of all trades is a master of none, right? So th that means typically they're designed for worst case. They're big bulky and designed for worst case. On the other hand, high capacity KA terminals, they achieve their performance through an integrated design, a holistic design concept, where the, the uh, terminal, the waveform, and the satellite are all designed at the same time. Tight high power KA beams allow for very small terminal apertures. You only need to illuminate about 60 centimeters in a high, KA, high capacity KA beam. If you go out to the Viasat booth outside, you'll see our 60 centimeter dish. And, you, and, and seeing he's believing, they can show it running and running at high speed. The waveform is also designed for high capacity KA. Wide span of mod codes, adaptive coding, spreading and modulation picks the right mod code for the right application. Network controlled uplink power control keeps, keeps the power minimum on the terminal, one or two watts. And with a network design with thousands of users in mind, there's, a, there's, there's built in network interference mitigation. So, and think of the large bandwidth, too. I told you earlier that the traditional satellites are constrained, like typical KU transponders are 36 megahertz, right? Maybe 72 with some birds. We're talking about hundreds of megahertz transponder size on high capacity KU birds. It supports thousands of users at, at, at a basic service. For 15, 15 down, five up is a base level service. And it only goes up from there. So, you don't need to go out and buy a purpose-built high-capacity KA terminal. You can, you can upgrade the currently fielded Army terminals to high-capacity KA. So now, our previous speaker talked about software-defined radios and software-defined modems as different from virtualized modems. So we, our CBM 400 modem, Viasat CBM 400 modem, is a, is a software-defined modem. It supports the three of the waveforms in use by the DoD today, Linkway, EBIM, and ArcLight, all of which are RSTRAT certified, by the way. It also supports our high capacity KA control software. So you, you mate that modem with our feed, uh, our transmit receive integrated assembly, and that feed can easily be put on any offset feed dish very easily and be with a little bit of work on a center fed dish. And then you can, you can move from commercial KU to WGS to high capacity KA, either Viasat's high capacity KA or KASAT in Europe or you know, MBNCO in Australia. And this is an example of 
Or, this is an example really to show there's no bad beams. So this is, uh, our, this is our, on, the, on the right there you see our small terminal, our multi-emission terminal, 60 centimeter. Um, this would be the same with other, with, with, with other vendors, high capacity K terminals that work on Viasat. Uh, working up in uh, uh, six, uh, almost 70 degrees north in Norway, getting 18 down, five, five meg up. That's the same, and that's the same as you'd get if you were in, in central Germany or in Czech Republic or something. There's no worst case, that's the point. When there's no worst case, you don't have to haul the big terminals around. So let me go back up a second. It mentioned that you only need to illuminate 60 centimeters of the dish. So you can take, let's say, a 2.4 meter SDT, Army SDT, just illuminate the center portion, you know, get, get the F to D correct and get the feed match. What does the rest of the dish do for you? It's a built-in shroud. It's a shroud, I'll give you that for free. You get a shroud that keeps the detection down. So in closing, so it's the integrated design of, K, of, of high capacity K systems, the networks, terminal, waveform, satellite, network control that uh, results in higher capacity, higher resiliency, and LPI, LPD almost for free. Because with those tight beams, you're just not going to, you got to, the, the, the adversary, whether he's an interceptor or interferer, has got to be inside your kill zone. Lightweight, high-capacity terminals are available today. You can go outside and see the one Viaset has, the multi-mission terminal. There's, you can go to the Acquire booth. There's one in the Acquire booth here. Um, I'll, you know, they're, they're available today, but you can also upgrade your current Army terminals straightforward, in a straightforward manner. Viaset, use SES, Utilsat, and others are investing billions of our, of our, of our dollars, private, private investment, to put these satellites in space. So why not use them? The other, you know, the Army, the, uh, the next generation uh, resilient satellites PTW, with the use PTW are a decade away. We have this available now, so why not use it? Thank you.